Alright, so my goal of reimagining Hero Quest, the old school um, Milton Bradley Games Workshop team up game, uh, as a 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons campaign, is doing really well. Uh, we just finished our fourth quest. Uh, there's one quest a month until we've done all 14 quests. Uh, so, now I'm going to prep for quest number five. Uh, it's not until March, I want to say fourth, something like that. But uh, if I get it knocked out today, then I don't have to worry about it anymore. So this is going to take us from the very beginning to the very end. Um, keep in mind that there is no actual published adventure, uh, nothing that I could download or anything um, and use as a guide. The only thing I have is the original quest book, uh, which is right here. And the quest that we we're doing is Melar's Maze. So look at all that. Uh, we got mummies, we got some kind of library. Uh, let's see, lots of traps. Traps are nice. Looks like there's a gargoyle. Uh, so there's some interesting stuff here. Now, Hero Quest, being a dungeon board game, was obviously limited in its scope of what monsters you can send. Being a Dungeons and Dragons game and a Roll20 game, we are not limited in any way. So we can throw anything we want up in here. I've thrown chimeras, dragons, all that good stuff. So, uh, let's see what we're going to do. Um, Melar's Maze. Here we go. Long ago, a powerful wizard by the name of Melar created a talisman of lore which would enhance the wearer's understanding of magic. It is rumored that Melar hid the talisman in an underground laboratory at the heart of his maze, fearing it might be stolen by the evil minions of Zargon. He's like the bad guy wizard that you never actually get to fight. He's basically the dungeon master. Um, as you search for the talisman, beware of many traps and deadly monsters. Okay, so that's pretty cool. That's like enough information to, you know, get us get us started. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really, you know, explain too much. Like, why are we going there? Like. Are the Minions of Chaos trying to get there first? Again, this is a board game for 10-year-olds, so um, I have kind of dug into that to try to figure out a little bit more about what's going on here, and I came up with a slightly different narrative that sort of builds on what we have so far, which the premise is the heroes are like a SEAL Team 6, basically a spec ops group that was hired and trained by uh, Sir Ragnar who is a retired Imperial Knight. And so Sir Ragnar, um, you know, used his money and his experience to train up this group of, of super-powered heroes, and he sends them on, like, Black Ops missions. Like, we need a small, specialized team to sneak into enemy territory. Something that an army couldn't do. Like, that kind of thing. Um, so, thus far they've blown up things they've snuck into things they've stolen things uh now they need to go and retrieve something so i feel like there needs to be a little bit more to it than that um so what i have here is it has been several months since your victory against ulag and the orcs of the black mountains a tentative peace has settled over the land, and thanks to your efforts at Shale Lake, the Empire's economy is slowly recovering from the hardships of war. Everywhere you look, you can see signs of prosperity and renewal. But your heroic heart grows restless, and the haunting death cries of your many adversaries promising a rising tide of darkness and chaos hang like ominous clouds on the horizon of your thoughts. It is a mild summer morning, when a royal messenger arrives. Sir Ragnar sends word that no new reports have come in from scouts nor scryers of chaos activity. This is no exaggeration. Not a single orc nor imp has been spotted in months. This complete lack of activity is suspicious. But despite all our best efforts, no intel can be gained on our enemy's actions. We believe the forces of chaos to be magically shielding themselves from our spies and divinations. Ranger, rogue, scout, none return with any news. 
The priests receive no visions from their prayers, and the Imperial High Wizard Wardos and his associates are also unable to provide any information. But there is a way. Long ago, a great sage and diviner named Melar was said to have created an amulet of incredible potency. It is called the Talisman of Lore, and with it, one can see anything, past, present, and future. Find it, and we will use its powers to discover what the forces of chaos have been up to. Far south of the Imperial City lay the ruins of a once great city. Within that city lies a labyrinth built by Melar himself shortly before his death. It is said that he sealed within this deadly vault his greatest creation. The Talisman of Lore. But be careful. Melar's maze is a twisting death trap and has become home to a tribe of savage and territorial beastmen. Not to mention the undying souls of the damned who haunt the ruins. Alright. Sounds pretty cool. Not sure about the beastmen thing. It would be a nice change of pace from orcs and it does definitely stick with um, the theme of playing in the Warhammer fantasy setting, where they did not have uh, the same array of creatures, but Chaos Beastmen were, were definitely a thing. Uh, so those would be like goat dudes and stuff like that. Um, all right, so we compare and contrast. So what I came up with basically just gives them a more grown up, like explained away reason for coming here. Um, so, things that we need to pay attention to. Obviously, there were five things that the adventure felt was important because they mentioned them here. So, the first hero finds some healing potions. Meh, not a problem. Um, so, we'll definitely make sure to include some healing potions. There is a gargoyle here. Um, it is made of stone. This gargoyle only comes to life after one of the heroes opens the door that leads to the next room. Um, the gargoyle cannot be harmed until it has moved or attacked a hero. All right, that's interesting. Um, there is a chest with poison gas, but it actually also has some money in there. It's pretty good. Um, the first hero who searches for treasure will find the Talisman of Lore. Excellent. And secret doorways. Uh, let's see. They can find Melar's key. Upon touching it, the key will disappear, and the throne will slide sideways, revealing a secret door. Okay, so it looks like the secret door is what leads to uh, the deeper parts of the dungeon. Okay, I don't really know how much work it saves them. This is kind of a maze. All right, let's see what Heroic Maps has cooked up for this uh, dungeon. So, over at Drive Through RPG, uh, Heroic Maps has the Ruins of Sorcerer's Keep. This is from their Heroic Quest series. See, it's not Heroic Quest, it's Heroic Quest. It's a totally different thing. All right, this is a 30 by 30 map, so it's going to be nice and small. That's good. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous, as usual. It takes place in the jungle, so it's good that I said the south. Nice. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get this thing in there. Uh, if we're dealing with a, uh, what is this, 30 by 30, I could probably copy the Hero Quest 4, uh, roll 20 thing over. Uh, essentially, the settings that I'm looking for is if it's 30 by 30, having maybe a 20 margin would be good because it'll give me lots of places to stash uh, DM stuff. You always want to have a margin around your maps so you can stash stuff. Uh, all right, so here we go. We've got uh, grid enabled, black background, dynamic lighting enabled, enforced line of sight, only update on drop, restrict movement. Fog of War and Advanced Fog of War, I'll be honest, it kills like a lot of people's Chrome browsers. A lot of people like to use Chrome. Um, since you have to run a game that everybody can play uh, right now, I wouldn't bother with that. Uh, I don't need it to play any music because I use GroovyBot through Discord for music. So, cool. Happy with that. Let's rename the page so it's not uh, Quest 4 copy. And let's jump over and see what we got. As always, when you copy an existing map in Roll20, um, you get nothing. That's, that's really helpful. Um, if you actually wanted to copy the map, you would need to transmog it out and then transmog it back in. 
So you'd have to go to a different game, transmog it over there, and then transmog it back. Which is a paid feature, and it's a total pain in the butt. Alright, I'm going to drag over this map, get it loaded in. And this map is pretty big. It's uh, 8.68 megs. Uh, I think the limit right now on roll 20 is 10 megs, maybe 15 if you have a pro account. Something like that. Um, but honestly, I used to shrink the maps down to uh, save room, but you just lose so much quality. So I just kind of bite the bullets and hope that I don't run out of storage space. Yeah, and it's taken a uh, hundred years to upload. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, while I wait for it to upload, let's turn on. Oh, there we go. Uh, let's see. Do we need to turn on? Eh. Um, yeah, let me show you these. I just made these two decks up here. These are treasure decks. Uh, they are a fantastic resource. Uh, essentially... They're just random drops. So if your players are like, I searched the room, and you're like, I don't know what's in the room, uh, you can just draw one of these cards, and they're sorted by level tier. And you can say, oh, yeah, you find uh, this. Um, and if you don't like any, if you're not sure which item to give them off the list, you could always uh, have a handy dandy D12 and give it a roll. And then say, oh, yeah, um, the orc was carrying five gold, two silver, and four copper pieces stamped with a forest clearing hiding various small animals. What? Right? Um, and the players are going to be like, wow. Wow. How, how, does, how do they come up with this crap? Yeah. So that's why these cards are super, super handy. All right. So now we've got this uh, map loaded in. We are going to... Go to advanced, go to set dimensions. We know that it's a 30 by 30 map because they told us that when we bought it. So we're gonna say 30 by 30. Now, they do, uh, when you purchase these maps from Heroic Quest, they do uh, include a gridded version. But since Roll20 can make a grid, uh, no reason to use the gridded one, in my opinion, because you could always reuse this map to make a giant-sized version of the map. So you just kind of stretch it out, and now it's suitable for a giant. Um, and just like that, you have uh, a second use of the map. All right, now we've got it in there. We're going to go to the map layer with it. We're going to zoom in, and you can see, because these guys are professionals, it perfectly fits. Oh, lovely. All right, it is very dark in this map. Uh, we have roll 20 with a paid account, so we get all the good stuff, including dynamic lighting, so we wanna take advantage of that. Now, this is gonna be an interesting one because there is an outside version uh, part of the map and an inside version, uh, which is tricky. So the first thing that I like to do uh, is I go to draw shape, and I set it to like a bright color that's gonna be easy for me to notice. And I do a bright color because sometimes you're on the wrong layer and you draw um, a bunch of stuff for dynamic lighting, but you drew it like on the token layer and you're not gonna be able to ignore it if it's like neon green and neon pink. So that's why I do that. Uh, I wanna make sure I'm on the right layer, dynamic lighting. And then I'm going to hold down shift, which activates snap to grid. And I'm going to left click and drag a bounding box around the entire map. So, why a bounding box? Because 100% this will at least make sure that the characters inside aren't going to see outside of the map to like the DM margins. So all this black area, that's my DM margins. That's where I'm going to stash things that I don't want the players to see. This is the Roll20 equivalent of a DM screen, is this area outside the map. So I do that, and then I can actually go in and start uh, drawing it. Now, it's kind of dim, so I'm going to throw down a light source real quick so that we can see better. So um, I have a million and a half templates that I've built. One of the little template tokens that I've made is called Sunlight Bright. So it is a little token that just radiates like 5,000 feet of sunshine. 
So if I click on it, you can see 5,000 feet of sunshine. Everybody could see it. Beautiful. Uh, and if I alt double click and go to its character sheet, you can see that it's just like a duplicate of like a light source um, character sheet. Basically, I made an NPC called like Torchlight, and then I copied it over and over and over again, and turned each one of them into a different type of token. That's how I built my tokens. So I have the sun. The sun is out, shining bright, uh, which is good because they arrive here, we'll say during the day. Um, the cool thing about a one shot is you can kind of like say a lot of things are true and everybody just agrees with you because they just want to make sure they get to play the whole dungeon before they run out of time. Uh, it's a very liberating experience, trust me. And then I'm going to put, I'm going to select this, hit control C, click over here and do control V. And now I have another light source over here. Cool. Uh, why do I want another light source? Uh, just so that sunlight is going to hit all of the outdoor areas. Now the cool thing about putting the sun tokens on the dynamic lighting layer is that when I go back to object layer, the lighting will stay, but I won't see the light source, which is cool because it's less distracting to your players. All right, let's go ahead and build this thing. So uh, this part is a little, mm, I don't want to say tedious. It could be Zen, right? So you just go through and I'm using the polygon slash line tool and I'm just clicking, clicking, and just clicking my way uh, through all this good stuff. And I'm going to do this until uh, I have everything selected. Now this dungeon has nice fat five foot thick walls, which is really cool. Don't get me wrong, a character with stone shape, and I've never actually seen this happen, maybe because my players are decent human beings, but uh, the stone shape cantrip, which is honestly one of the best cantrips in the game, uh, they could just like move the wall out of the way and just, you know, just tunnel through the whole dungeon, um, which sucks for dynamic lighting for sure, but as a player, man, does it save a lot of time. All right, so... Uh, when you're done with the line, you either connect it back where you started or you hit right mouse and that will terminate the line you're drawing and make it, I don't know, make it real. All right. So then I go and I trace this grotto. So we've got this cool grotto, which was not obviously in the original hero quest. I feel like we definitely want to do something cool with this cool grotto. And when I say cool, I of course mean a frog hemoth. So we're definitely going to put a frog hemoth uh, in this watery area. A Frog Hemoth, uh, I think they first came out in Volos for 5th edition. Uh, and they were used in Tomb of Annihilation as well. It is a nasty monster. Um, a lot of fun to DM. It tentacles, swallows you whole. I'm a big fan of monsters that swallow you whole. Alright. So we'll definitely throw at least one of those in there. I don't know. Maybe a missed opportunity not to. Uh, or, since this is a magic user's place, maybe some water weirds. That's another cool monster. It's like a water elemental, but a snake. Uh, let's see. Alright, this wall is significantly skinnier. So, we'll double back. There we go. Another skinny wall right here. Double back. Uh, we also have mushrooms. So, maybe... If we wanted to do something different than Beastmen, we could do Myconids. Might be kind of fun. Like, I mean, I haven't read the flavor text of the party yet, so uh, Myconids don't get enough play, honestly. Uh, so it could have been taken over. Oh, you know what else? Veggie Pygmies. I mean, we're getting a little far away from the whole um, Warhammer fantasy, but man, Veggie Pygmies would be pretty funny. Especially if they're in like a jungle area. A veggie pygmy is like, um, I don't know, like a goblin myconid. It's just like a plant creature that has a little ponytail and a spear. They're, they're adorable. They were also in a Tomb of Violation. Alright. Uh, you don't have to be this precise. Uh, I'm like tracing all these like nooks and crannies. I feel like it does add a bit more um, of a dynamic to the dungeon to have this sort of stuff traced. Uh, I'm skipping some of the blocks because I could go back and add depth to that later. 
Uh, but yeah, this uh, this particular map is not as easy as just holding down, um, you know, shift and like snapping to the grid and then we're done. There's definitely a lot more going on here. And you can see we're um, trying to draw outside of the lines, not directly on the line of the wall. Um, I think I have found that the players definitely prefer um, kind of seeing uh, the artwork for the wall because it kind of removes any unsurety they have about like, hey, what is this thing? So I've started doing that. And you can see as I'm laying down these walls that the light sources I put for the outdoor sun are starting to be blocked by the walls, which is creating a situation where it is sunny on the outdoor parts of the dungeon without uh, having to turn on global illumination and light up the entire dungeon, which is pretty cool. All right, so here I'll just come back and do a straight line for that one. All right, down to here. All right. And you could do anything with these divots in the walls. People see divots in the walls, they immediately either A, want to look for treasure, or B, they want to look for traps. Um, you could say that these alcoves in the wall are full of random, like, Bob's Relief uh, sculptures. You could say that they hold, like, uh, they used to hold torches, so now they have, like, empty sconces or something like that. Um, lots of neat things. That's the cool thing about having a cool map, is it encourages you um, to think outside the box and come up with, like, clever and creative um, extras that maybe when you were planning the adventure uh, you didn't think about because you didn't want to over prep like you don't need to write a room description for every part of the dungeon especially if they're not going to go to every room of the dungeon um, but if you have a nice detailed map that goes a long way towards helping you describe the room when they get there all right so we go down here and again, we're just tracing the room. It's super relaxing. It's like, I don't know, coloring in a coloring book, kind of. Uh, these areas I'll fix later. And here's the thing. Like, this is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And I'm not stressing it. Uh, because they're going to come in. They're going to experience the dungeon. They're going to leave. And then we're going to move on with our lives. We're going to do another adventure. So stressing out real hard about how perfectly I did all the walls and stuff. Not going to do anybody any good. All right, it's starting to get dark in here now. So now I'm going to go ahead and start adding these. Wherever you can, you should think about overlapping your um, lines. Because uh, anywhere that there is a gap, light will escape through it. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. Alright, I think there was... Here we go. We said we were going to double back for this, so let's do that. Alright, and then... Oh, secret door there. So this is going to be a little tricky, because we want it to look nice, but it looks like the grid lies perfectly on there. So we're going to hold down shift, and perfectly snap to the grid there. Excellent. And same thing on the other side, perfectly snapped to the grid. Yeah, secret doors can be tricky. Um, you can kind of see already that, oh, they're going to notice that there's um, like a little black line there indicating that there's a secret door. So short of Photoshopping that kind of stuff away, you have to come up with like a clever way to disguise it. And honestly, at the same time, it's kind of like a, a neat Easter egg because if the players are paying enough attention to the map, maybe they notice that inconsistency and that's what helps them figure out that there's a secret door. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There we go. Now I'm going to switch to green real quick. Uh, use green for doors. So I'm going to snap to grid and snap to grid. I'm going to make it go a long ways. There we go. Yeah, all right. So we'll leave the lines there. We'll see if they notice anything weird about it. And, you know, that'll be cool. Uh, back to dynamic lighting. I'm going to switch back to pink because I'm not ready to do all the doors yet. 
And it's starting to get really dark in here now as we've cut the interior of the dungeon off from the exterior uh, light sources. If, while you're building, it is too dark, uh, you can always go to the settings for the map. And you could always um, turn the opacity down on the darkness so that you could see a little bit better. I think that was the right one. Maybe it's a little further down. Yeah, this one. Or you could turn it all the way up if you wanted to, to see just how dark it would be for the players. Pretty cool. Uh, let's see, back in here. I'm gonna lower it a little bit so I have a better idea of what I'm building inside. Okay, any other areas that we need? There we go. Uh, also, in order to move around, I am using um, the hotkeys for Roll20. Hotkeys can be enabled by going to the gear, clicking on, uh, you know, enable hotkeys or whatever. It's some option here. Um, once you have that enabled, you can do stuff like um, if you have the uh, selector, you can right click to get the hand tool and move around. Uh, you can use the mouse wheel to scroll up and down unless you've set it for your zoom tool. Um, so, yeah, you get like extra stuff that you could do with the hotkeys. It definitely speeds up the process a little bit. Otherwise, it can be a little tedious sometimes uh, to build these things. Uh, here we can see another secret door situation. Uh, so I'm going to handle that in a second. For now, we're going to focus on this room. This is actually a pretty challenging one to light because of its maze-like structure and its weird passageways and all that. Let's see. I mean, it is called Malar's Maze, so... I don't know what I expected. And this was a dungeon that as a kid playing Hero Quest, you could pretty much just walk in and clear this whole dungeon in like 15 minutes, which was a little disappointing. Oh man. All right, we'll go down to here. There we go. And there's the gargoyle you can see that they mentioned. So, maybe just completely owning the uh, Chult vibe here, we might go ahead and say that that gargoyle is a four-armed gargoyle, which is uh, an Acerarak special, and a very tough monster. Um, the, the party is level four now, so, you know, they could handle a greater threat. Um, they also have lots of cool hero questy um, potions and stuff to back them up. And it's a one-shot, so, I mean, you know, you could worry about balance later. All right, let's see what we got here. But, yeah, Forum Gargoyle, that's a tough monster. Um, if you haven't seen the stat block for it, um, you can obviously check it out on D&D Beyond or, you know, wherever you get your monster stats from. Um, it's a it's a doozy. It's kind of kind of beast mode. Uh, let's see. Some monsters they're worth the CR um, that that that's listed, and some are definitely not. I don't know what this thing is. Um, I think it's called like an Ori. I don't know. Um, some kind of gyroscope looking thing. That's not included. Um, in the hero quest original so we should do something fun with this it is a maze so maybe this thing will teleport them like to a random spot in the dungeon uh, which is a pain in the ass to run uh, but is also a very memorable thing like nobody likes a maze and nobody likes being separated in a maze especially a maze that we're going to fill up with all sorts of deadly stuff uh, so it will create a memorable uh a memorable moment to be sure if people get separated in this maze all right and let's see is that everything can we start throwing our doors in there zoom it out uh, looks like there's a little bit of wall here that I missed I think I might have actually covered up a door yeah, I did. Okay. So we'll do that. And 
that. And I think that is all. Oh, look at that. We get this outside cliff. So let's do that real quick. All right, hold on. There we go. Yeah, if the distance isn't far enough uh, for the dynamic lighting, it will not um, start drawing a path. It'll just try to terminate itself. There we go. Alrighty. Man, I feel like there should be something in the moat, too. There's a lot of cool possibilities for this map. Uh, I'm excited. Alright, so now for doors. I've found over the years that a line for a door is cool, but a rectangle is even better. A nice chonky rectangle makes it easy to see where the door is, because people like to open and close doors. And uh, it also kind of sticks out a lot, so players will be like, hey, is that a door? And you'll be like, of course it is. I didn't forget. Um, so I'm going to go through and draw all the doors that I could see. It also is useful for like a double door because you just throw down two chonky uh, rectangles and you're done, which is nice. Uh, let's see. There we go. Any other doors? Look at this dead end back here. That's got to have something nasty in it. Oh, man. All right. Let me go here. And that's a secret door. This is the main door. The other thing we got to figure out is where is the MacGuffin going to be? Like, where is the whole reason they came to this dungeon? Like, because again, we don't want them to just poof, uh, get it and leave. I mean, this is a four hour session. We want to make sure that there's, uh, you know, that that's actually happening. This can be done a number of ways. Uh, one is you create a series of obstacles that must be overcome, uh, to access it. Um, so you have to connect the, you know, knee to the shin to the foot. I don't know. Um, you cause and effect your way to it. So you can't get to the final MacGuffin until you complete steps one, two, and three. Uh, that's, you know, it's very Zelda. Um, you could do it that way. Uh, you could also um, not have decided ahead of time. This is a super shady thing to do. Uh, you could decide that um, you will decide later which room has the amulet in it. And as they explore you'll just keep an eye on the game clock and as you get closer to uh, the end of the session uh, they will obviously get closer to finding it um, this is probably the most efficient and effective way to do it though i guess it would be cheating i don't know um yeah so something to keep in mind uh, let's see Another thing you could do is if they do find it, you could always um, essentially have an alarm system go off and that makes it harder to escape from the dungeon as certain pathways are no longer as accessible as they were. Um, so that's another thing you could do. And here you can see I am just adding a little bit more like shape and detail to the dynamic lighting layer so that the light will kind of lay out in a slightly more interesting way as they're exploring the dungeon. As I also kind of brainstorm, how will I ensure that they don't find the MacGuffin right away and then just walk out of the dungeon? Because because I've seen it happen. I've been there. I've, I've walked in and grabbed it and left. Um, pass, through, pass through wall was a thing. You could cheese most of the dungeons in the game. Uh, let's see. Because we have all these cool locations, and we want to fill them up with stuff. But anytime you have a maze-type dungeon, uh, you're never really going to see all the content for that dungeon. So you sort of have to accept that in your heart ahead of time, that no matter how cool the stuff in this dungeon is, they will not stick around and see all of it. Uh, you might have like a five-star group, and they like the five-star dungeons, and that's cool and all, but I doubt they are going to five star this in the four hour time block that this one shot is being run in. All right. 
And I think once we add this last secret door, uh, we are done with dynamic lighting and ready to jump into the actual populating of the dungeon. Alrighty. So, 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 so. Let's see what we've got. Switch back to here. It is dark in there. I will lighten it up just so that we can tell what we're doing. Because it doesn't look like there's too many light sources in here. I think if we were to add some light sources, we could do... Uh, this looks like some kind of magical fountain or clock. So that might be kind of hype. So what I will do is I will grab... Uh, I will go back to my dynamic lighting layer. And I'm going to grab a fire token built the same way that the sun token was built. And I'm going to drop it in here. All right. And so this will illuminate the room, which will kind of freak people out because they'll want to be like, why is this doing that? And we won't make it super bright, though. So we'll do like dim light, uh, 20 feet of it. And I did that negative five, because if you do like a negative five as the second number, it indicates that all of the light that is let off by the object is going to be dim light. All right, and then to save time, I will copy that dim light source, and I'll also put it on this thingamajig. Sweet. Alrighty. So now we'll go to the object layer and I will turn on global illumination just so I could see what the heck I'm doing. Ah, much better. All right. Uh, lots of treasure chests here. Am I going to stress about what's in these treasure chests? No, because one, I know that I've got one of them has to be trapped. Uh, and one, according to the Hero Quest uh, PDF, and uh, one of them has to have uh, a bunch of healing potions in it. So I guess I do need to decide which will be trapped and which will have healing potions. So, let's see. Um, if they get here, they either were very smart and found the secret door right away, or they worked really hard and traveled a really long way, or they were sneaky and they went uh, around the water feature and up onto the bridge. Either way, you probably should reward them for that and not punish them. So we are going to say on the GM's layer that this is the chest of healing pots. And I don't know. And 50 gold and gems. And I don't know. This I think this is going to be a bit of a meat grinder. So let's give them four healing pots. There we go. Alright, so that's taken care of. And let's see. That means we need another chest that has a poison gas trap in it. Oh, yeah. Look at how ominous this one looks. It's covered in cobwebs. There's food. Who the heck's going to mess with that? Uh, the players are. That's who. So, I'll just copy this text and paste it over here. You do want to make sure that this is happening on your GM layer. And a new feature, relatively new, is you could turn your opacity all the way up or all the way down or anywhere in between on your GM's layer. So while you're building, you might keep it all the way up so that everything's bright and easy to see and remember. Uh, once you're playing and it's a little more crowded, you might want to move it somewhere else. All right, so this is going to be poison gas trap. And we'll do a DC 14 because they're level four. So 10 plus four, it's a good DC to set. And uh, it will be uh, Phil's room with poison. And we don't want to be like horrible, but they have two dwarves. So like poison's not really a thing for them. So we'll do 5d8 uh, and poisoned one minute. Uh, and then we'll do save half, no poison. Sweet. And then if I hit enter, it takes it down another line. So now we have that right there. All right, sweet. What else do we have going on? Uh, this is kind of a boner room other than this bad treasure chest. And that's okay. You can have a boner room. Uh, they might say, what's up with all the food, and the food's in good shape, and all that kind of stuff. Well, um, 
there was rumor that beastmen lived in the dungeon, so maybe the beastmen keep it well stocked. Uh, also thinking about maybe using mushroom dudes instead, or veggie pygmies. I mean, who doesn't like fresh fruit, I guess, even if you're a mushroom person. So that's something that we could leave intact. Uh, Alright. Let's make sure we cover all our bases. We want to have a four-armed gargoyle. So I think, for me... Let's see if I can access four-armed gargoyle. Okay, so I have to import it from Jolt. Okay. So I'm going to go to Transmog, which is a paid roll 20 feature. And I'm going to scroll down to find uh, Tomb of Annihilation. There it is. Yeah, adventure-specific monsters, for whatever reason, do not get added um, to Compendium. Or at least they didn't used to. Um, I know when I got Salt Marsh, I'm pretty sure it added everybody to the Compendium from Salt Marsh. I can't remember. All right, so let's see. Where did this guy end up? There we go. Four-armed gargoyle. Drop this bad boy in. And I'll swap out the art later, but I will spare you um, watching me do Photoshop. Uh, Alright. Four-armed gargoyle. It's pretty nasty. 147 health. That's crazy. Uh, CR10. What are you doing? These are only fourth level adventures. Yeah. Maybe the maybe the giant four-armed gargoyle is a little too much here. Mm, maybe. Alright. Let's try something else. I think Stone Golem is also CR10, though. But I know that, like, one Gargoyle ain't gonna do squat, so... Now, technically, this thing only attacks them if it's, uh... If it's attacked first. So there is that. Um, so you could make it super strong and, you know, hope that they don't attack it. But, let's see. What's Stone Golem bring to the table? Oh yeah, he's also CR10. Oof. Um, he hits pretty hard. Only two attacks, though. Not nearly as bad as the other one. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Way more health, though. Alright. I kind of want to stick with the forearm gargoyle, because I want to do a shout-out to Chult. So what we're going to do is to hold down Alt and double-click, and that opens up the character sheet. I can duplicate it. And now I can go to the duplicate of uh, Formed Gargoyle, which is called Copy. And I will call this uh, hmm, Smaller Formed Gargoyle. There we go. That's a terrible name, but you know. Uh, here we go. We'll call it Discount. That's even better. Discount Formed Gargoyle. Because, like, a Sarak had, like, a yard sale, and Melar, like, managed to snag one of these collectibles for his, uh, for his place. Alright. Uh, so we're going to change the name, and we're going to do a couple of tweaks here. We obviously don't want it to have 147 health. That would take forever. Uh, immunity to poison's good. Immunity to petrification, poison exhaustion is good. It's still an elemental. Let's go ahead, and its constitution is 20, so it's getting 5 per hit die. So let's take out, I don't know, uh, 2 hit dice. Okay. Right. So let's see, that would be 10, and then another uh, 12. So 10 and 12 is 22. So that would reduce it down to, what I want to say, 25, 125 health. Okay, there you go. And let's see, what else can we do to kind of lower this thing's uh, power levels a little bit? Uh, let's see. Eh. Uh, see. Multi-attack, five attacks. Hmm. Well, it does have four arms. So, I mean, that that's technically a thing. Uh, false appearance. So really, it's just its insane action economy that seems to be uh, making it so strong. Let's say that its flight speed is diminished. Not that it really has too many places to fly in the dungeon. So we'll drop that to 60. Uh, or from 60 to 30. 
and we're really just going to have to nerf its damage output. Uh, we did reduce its hit dice a little bit, so let's let's lower all its attacks to a six, and then, instead of an eight, and then we'll lower all of its attack dice by one. Oh shoot! We also want to take exploding dice off. Yeah, I ran I ran to annihilation with exploding dice because I'm horrible. Uh, let's see, get rid of that. Bam, and boom. All right. So now we have a slightly scaled down version of the creature. Uh, we could also probably lower its armor class a little bit. I'm just lower it by one. Again, this is an optional monster. They don't even have to fight it. Um, cool. All right, so discount form gargoyle is a go. All right, and then he will be hiding on the... Oh, and since he's discount, we'll make him... There we go. I love it. So let's get rid of this and we'll drag out our discount form gargoyle and we'll shrink that boyo down. There we go. And then we will hide him on the GM layer. All right, we're already on the GM layer. Excellent. Okay, so according to the adventure, we have covered, uh, let's see. Hmm. I think my music went out. Hold on, let me throw in some more music. Music help focus. Music good. All right. So Melar's Maze. Chalkers with traps. We've got that. We got our poison uh, trap in there. We got our healing box. We've got our gargoyle. Uh, Talisman of lore. And the secret door. All right. So we've kind of done everything there is to do here. Um, hmm. Sweet. So now it's really just a matter of what we want to fill this dungeon with. Now you can see that they have mummies in there, lots of undead, a few orcs, um, skeletons, that kind of thing, uh, a mummy, another zombie. Yeah, so I'm not even sure why the three orcs are there, honestly. All right, let me get this out of the way. So we have... Uh, honor the original adventure. We have all that taken care of. I am going to be a total scumbag, and I am not going to commit to a location for uh, the end of lore. They're just going to like find it closer to the end of the session. So, just if you know the guys uh, that are going to be playing uh, in March in this adventure, don't tell them. Um, yeah. So, let's see. This is like a huge alchemist wizard's laboratory. I feel like there could definitely be some good play here. Three different chests. There is definitely some interest in doing something cool with that. Let's see what else. We got cool magic stuff we could throw in here. Because this is a, a wizrobe's lair uh, who is out of the game now. So let's do... I think there's an alchemical golem. Or is it... Mana Golem. Alchemical Golem. Alright, how strong are you? We don't want to have to keep toning her. Oh, he looks insane. Alright. Hey, CR9. Mm, I got a party of four. Mm. Or sorry, party of six level fours. Let's see what Cobalt Fight Club has to say. Cobalt Fight Club is really just there to justify bad decisions. Uh, let's see. Six level fours, um, set sources, earthen. Okay, let's throw this alchemical golem in there and see what happens. Uh, Al chemical golem construct. This must be from like the newer book. All right, let me just grab something that's also CR10. That works too. <laughs> yeah, despite doing this all the time, I can't just randomly math like um, the CR. All right, so they're saying that, oh, this is a CR9 though. Uh, 
Let's see. All right, so a young blue dragon is the same as uh, this thing. And it says that it is hard, not even deadly. Boom, there you go. Uh, so let's see, what does this golem bring to the table? What would be what would be cool about using this one? Well, that's the armory golem, which is also hype, but there you go. All right. Let's see, he has a poison breath. Again, not that big of a threat for our party because they um, have two dwarves, uh, cleric, all sorts of other stuff. Um, this just makes two slam attacks, alchemical infusion. Uh, let's see, syringes, poke its back, brimstone. Uh, okay, so it can, it can change itself up. That's pretty hype. And it's mostly necrotic damage. Elemental expulsion. Whenever the golem takes acid, cold fire, or lightning, all creatures within 20 feet of the golem must take tw uh, dexterity saving throws or take damage equal to what the golem took. That's kind of exciting. That's a pretty fun thing. All right. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go ahead and use this uh, this crazy monster. All right. Sounds good to me. So this will be hanging out here in his lab essentially that works uh does he need any kind of support probably not would it be fun to give him some support absolutely so what else could be in the lab let's do some mephits mephits are utter garbage um but i could see like them being bound to work for a An alchemist. Let's do smoke. Yeah. Ooh, spooky. All right. So smoke. Uh, they got a cinder breath weapon that barely does any damage. Oh, it doesn't do any damage. It causes them to be blind, and it could hit you maybe for a D4 and change. Um, and it can cast dancing lights. Yeah, I think they'll be okay. Um, but it does help the action economy out just a little bit. So we got this guy and his friend. All right, so we've got that room taken care of. And what are we going to do about loots? That's why we have these treasure cards. We can just draw from them as needed. Uh, are any of the chests in this laboratory going to be trapped? Well, the adventure does state that there was heck amounts of traps, so we could just add um, heck amounts of traps. But let's go ahead and populate it first. All right. What else do we got? Uh, it would be cool if, uh, let's see, back at the beginning, they arrive, and maybe there's something in the moat. Yeah, we talked about something living in the moat. This could be a good place to put our friend the Frog Hemoth. And Frog Hemoth is also an insanely high-level monster. Yeah, another CR-10. Um... Let's just go with it. Uh, this will be another optional. Like, as long as you stay away from the water, it's not going to bother you kind of thing. So it could be another evasion uh, situation. And right now, I'm dropping all these monsters onto the GM Slayer. And I can move them later um, if they would be visible to the players or not. Um, let's see. Doors to the tomb. We should probably have them be locked to give the rogue something to do or the barbarian who wants to smash it so we'll do uh main doors locked and dc 20 all right and then obviously we want to make sure that we remember this is a secret door and let's see what's going on in the wizard's bedroom that's awkward uh oh you know it'd be super creepy let's have a mommy be in the bed yeah so we'll do a mommy and the mommy's just sleeping in the bed uh is it melar is it melar's special somebody i don't know um but there's a mommy in the bed it's cool uh this right here excellent place for a trap uh, the dungeon that we are basing this on 
it mentions, uh, where is it? Here we go. A, a falling block trap. Now, falling block traps were super cool in Hero Quest because they actually changed the map. When a falling tr block trap fell, it would actually divide up the party. So let's put a falling block trap. Yeah, let's put a falling block trap right here. So basically this whole area just kind of gets crunched in and that is that. So we need to have some kind of block maybe. Mm -hmm. Yep, collapsed. Okay, okay, we can make that work. So we'll bring this over. And we'll do that. And then we'll face it the other way. So when that collapses, it blocks like both ways through. And then you slide a dynamic lighting in there. That'll basically make it so you can't go through that area anymore, which will divide up the party. Very cool. All right. Uh, and we want to make sure that we don't forget about that. So we'll put um, more text. And this is a pretty big falling block, so it's it's going to hurt pretty bad. Um, let's see, fourth level characters, uh, worst case scenario, they have a zero bonus to their constitution, and they're using D6s for the wizard. So at worst, they would have, what, 4 times 4, 16 health. So let's make these falling blocks do 3D6 damage. And it is a dex... Uh, DC 14. Uh, if they fail by 5, pinned. Must choose which side to end turn on. Uh, success equals half damage because tax those hit points. All right. And let's see. So they keep making their way through and then we've got this water area. So what might be kind of fun is this is a water area that they, and whenever I say it's going to be fun, it means it's going to be terrible for the players. Um, what would be really fun right here is, A, if these mushrooms were glowy. So glowy mushrooms are always fun. So let me go back to dynamic lighting and grab my glowy light source. And I'll plop a few down on the mushrooms. They will, of course, be curious slash cautious about the mushrooms. And that is their right. It also is nice because it does add a little ambiance um, if there are characters that are using torches or relying on dark vision to see. So it just adds a little bit more ambiance to the dungeon. Uh, everybody's played video games. You like being able to, to see in a dungeon. You don't ever question why the tombs of Skyrim have well-tended to candles um, that are always lit, never run out of wax. Uh, all right, so as you are kind of traversing this, what if we just went, you know, we went old school and put some quippers in there. Quippers are just D&D &D piranhas. And, uh, yes, they do travel in swarms. Um, adorable. So we can have some quippers in there. They're only CR1. Um, but, you know, like, if enough of them get on you, they could cause some problems. They got a swim speed of 40. This is another monster that could be evaded, so we don't have to feel too guilty about it. So let's throw, mm, I don't know, like, we'll say like five things of quippers live here. There could be some questions like, what do the Quippers eat? How do the Quippers live if they're in a sealed dungeon? It doesn't make any sense. We'll figure that out later. All right. So then we got a hallway up ahead when they come out of the stairs. And what can they do at that point? Uh, let's see. If they go down this hallway, that is where the alchemical golem is. 
Hmm. I like the idea that the alchemical golem is right there to get them when they first come in, but I kind of think it would be better if the alchemical golem was in the back and he had like a sheet on him and they didn't know about it until it was too late. Because I'd really like them to get into this room. Otherwise, our boy here is going to be squeezing the whole time. So, and that's very like Frankenstein, right? To have him like underneath a sheet. So what could we have here? Uh, we could just put a statue to kind of represent him being inactive. All right. So we've got a nice pack of statues to choose from once they populate. There we go. Really, though, as, well, as soon as they see a statue, they're going to get super uh, paranoid. So anytime there's a statue. And that's fair. I would... If I was an adventurer, I, well, first of all, I wouldn't be because I'm a huge scaredy cat. But uh, yeah, anyways, uh, here we go. So she's kind of big. We make her that big. There we go. All right, so that guy's in the GM layer. So we'll move this over here. And then token layer so they can see it. So that'll kind of draw their curiosity, maybe. Um, We'll say that there's like a sheet thrown over it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, this is a great place to put another trap, right? Like, why have this extra alcove if there's not going to be a trap here? So we're going to go with like a flamethrower. Hmm. So in this case, we've got a line of acid. Ooh, because alchemy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There we go. So we'll have a line of acid go here. And we'll just kind of keep to the same values that we've been using. So we'll do a DC 14. We'll do some damage. Uh, let's see. 3D6 is pretty good, but we'll make it 3D8 at this point. And let's see. If they fail by 5, uh, AC reduced by 4. Oh, I'm so repaired. And then success will equal just half damage. Nice. Okay. Cold as acid spray. Whoops. That's the one bad thing about hotkeys is if you're going too fast and you don't um, actually type it to a field. Oh my gosh. Come on, roll 20. Uh, it will get very upset and start doing random stuff with your hotkeys. All right, there we go. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so they go in there, they deal with that jabrones. Um, if they get to this room too fast, uh, we could say something like, uh, you find a journal. The journal indicates that uh, Millar did not feel comfortable hiding the amulet uh, in his workshop. And then you pick a location that they haven't been to on the map. And it's like, um, from what you could tell, uh, he entrusted a stone guardian with it. So now they have to go and find the gargoyle. And maybe the gargoyle has, is like wearing it or something. Might be kind of hype. Um, yeah, you could kind of just change the clue that is here to indicate where they need to go next. That again, super shifty, but it ensures like a one shot narrative pace that will make sure they don't finish the dungeon too quick. And will also, um, kind of get them to visit some of the different parts of the dungeon. All right. Uh, here we have another statue which by now they're probably going to be paranoid about statues. To increase that paranoia, I am going to reuse the statue that is there. So instead of the statue from uh, the heroic map, I will use uh, this one. There we go. Overlay it a little bit. So they'll definitely be freaked out by that. Um, I feel like this is another opportunity for traps. Uh, Let's see, Melar's Maze has one, two, three, four pit traps, and we haven't done any pit traps yet. That seems like a great place for a pit trap. 
So let's go ahead and throw a pit trap down. Uh, let's see. Do we want spiky, extra spiky, acid? I mean, we've been doing pretty good with acid. Could be fun. Yeah, all right. So we'll put an acid pit trap there. Yikes. Okay. Um, same deal with uh, the acid spray. So we'll just sort of copy that same thing. So we got to move this back to the GM Slayer. Okay. Uh, we'll call this acid pit. Uh, 3d8 damage. Uh, also a dexterity to avoid. Um, it's sort of a do or die kind of thing. Fill by five. No chance to grab ledge. That might be kind of cool. Nah, we should just dump them in the acid. All right. And then uh, fail, fall in. And it's, we'll say, 10 feet down. And 10 feet deep. It's a lot of acid. And there's no su success, just means you, you don't fall in. All right. Cool. Uh, let's see. We've got a secret door here. We will make this a good statue. So this the statue is how you open the secret door. I mean, you decide, I don't know, hold its hand, give it a kiss, uh, tell it a story, whatever you want to do. Uh, all right, so that's the secret door right there. Nice. Uh, we could make it a one-way secret door, which would kind of limit their stuff a little bit which is cool so let's do that uh, so they might detect it from the other side but not have a means to open it which is cool uh, here's a room full of random stuff what do we do with this random stuff you pull a treasure card no problem there uh, let's see overgrown with leaves and stuff not everything has to be a crazy fight uh random teleporter we will deal with that later uh form gargoyle is form gargoyle here is a library this is a likely place honestly for it to be like if i had to choose one initially i'd probably say here but what we could do is we will say in that uh location one and then the other one will be location two there we go so location one and location two basically if they get here too quickly we tell them that there's notes that indicate he kept it in his lab if they get to the lab too quick you give them notes that tell them that he kept it in the library now we're at least committed to two different places uh, what could we put in the library? Uh, let's put paper stuff. So let's see. Have them, have them fight books. So let's see. Paper. We got paper drakes. We got a paper golem. There you go. Keeping the theme up. We're going to definitely have to find cooler art. Uh, paper golems are super weak and they could paper cut you. I kind of like that. Uh, oh, and they do travel in a swarm. Okay. Swarm is a CR3. Yeah, okay. So we basically have a bunch of books fly off the shelves, the books and scrolls, and they attack everybody. That's fantastic. All right, so we'll do... We'll say four. Because there's four different shelves, roughly. Three different shelves. Yeah, whatever. Uh, Maybe this paper Drake. What's he got? Oh, he's cool looking. That's cool looking. Uh, he is small and adorable. Uh, okay, he can shelve himself. That's even more adorable. Um, and he can fold himself into different origami shapes. I'm kind of in love with this creature. 
Uh, what does it do? Um, let's see. It can slash you and incapacitate you with its tail. And that's about it. Uh, it's super cool. It just doesn't really do much as far as like these guys like fly out and kill you. I feel like he's just more of the same. So, hmm. Hmm. oh well. Uh, I guess he could be like leftover familiar type thing that the uh, wizard robe left behind. Is he a construct? No, he's an actual dragon. Um, I feel like too much time has passed for him to still be a little, a little guy. All right, let's see. This passageway right here is just crying out, just crying out for traps. So let's go ahead and throw some traps in there real quick. Uh, ye old a pit traps uh, will work nicely. So that's a good one right there. Oh yeah, look at how it just kind of hugs the natural shape of the dungeon. I dig it. There we go. We'll make like a weird kind of like um, maze, like when you're trying to get through a Pokemon gym. Yeah, cool. Oh yeah, <laughs> sweet. Um, okay, yeah, that looks obnoxious. Uh, let's see. So then we've got this back end here. We did talk about Myconids living in there. So let's check out Myconids real quick. All right, a Myconid death, death cap. Oof, that sounds really bad. All right, let's throw it out there. Oh, he's so uggos too. Uh, CR4. Mm. Mm, that's rough. Okay. Uh, slumber spores can make people fall asleep. Hype. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, let's have this guy lives back here, and then he'll have a bunch of little baby Mykonids. Oh. Those guys are CR0. And they can hit you for 1d4 minus 1, but some poison damage. They only have a plus 1 in their attack roll. 10 foot radius of spores. Spores can go around corners. Uh, what do they do? Affected creatures can communicate telepathically. I mean, that's kind of cool, but not that cool. Let's let's go the Veggie Pygmy route. There we go. Look at those things. Disgusting. Uh, these are CR14, but they kind of feel like... Um, like plant kobold situation and we'll say they work for this guy there we go and they will have terraformed this whole region this is their this is their region this is where they live uh so we'll just put a bunch of these dudes down and this is their boss and you know there's the veggie pygmy chief but that other guy looks so cool uh, let's see yeah, this is Vegetable Chief. He's nobody. This is the boss. Uh, so yeah, they live there. That's cool. Um, I think we filled just about everything up. This will be an empty room, because sometimes you need an empty room uh, to take a short rest in, or a long rest, I guess, because this dungeon's looking like it's going to be a little brutal. Uh, let's see. Over here, in this room, maybe this is where the Paper Drake is at. Eh, nah, that doesn't seem cool. We'll just leave that alone. Uh, anything else of interest? Got uh, some water here. Hmm. Oh, you know what would be cute? More frogs. But not like a frog chemoth, just, just regular frogs. So, Frogs are super cute because they're like the first monster that could eat you. Uh... Yeah, even though they're only medium, they can still eat. Oh no, they can only eat small people. Oh. Lame. Uh, well, I guess if we made them a little bit bigger. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, because then how would he get outside to eat? Mm, true. All right, we might just have to leave it as is. I think they've got enough stuff to do in this dungeon now. 
Uh, finally, we did talk about this thing teleporting you if you messed with it. So let's get some teleportation stuff thrown out here real quick. So I have these number tokens that I like to use. Uh, so, and of course, roll 20 doesn't care that I gave them beautiful numbers to label them. It just randomly spits them out into here. Uh, we're going to get one, two, three, four, five, six, six locations. Okay. So we just need number four. Hunt and peck for number four. 40. Uh, there's number four. All right. So if you mess with this thing, you get teleported to a random location. So where should a random location be? Uh, back to the beginning. That's a good location. Boop. And then... Oof. Uh, bedroom? Awkward. Okay. Uh, let's see. Right at these stairs. Oh, even worse. Oh, man, this is probably the worst place we could put them. No, it could get worse. Uh, let's see. Teleport. Uh, oh, God. Like, right there with the frog emoth. What about the bridge? Uh, it doesn't feel like that's far enough away. You know, dropping him in with the frog emoth seems especially cool. Uh, let's see. Okay. Random storeroom. There we go. And five... They get teleported back into this water. And then six. Hmm. Six could be here. And then they at least have the sense not to fight those guys. Or six could just be you don't teleport anywhere. Hmm, that's not very fun. Here. We will say that you teleport high up in the air and you sploosh down into the water and that this guy's default is to hide back there. So you at least have some time to get away from him. Yeah, that'll be fun. So you teleport like 50 feet in the air and you splash down into the water. Exciting. All right, um, so there we go. Uh, we have a dungeon that is dynamically lit for outdoor settings and indoor settings. Uh, we've filled it with traps. We've added some crazy stuff that could happen. We didn't stress about uh, loot and treasure because we have special decks that we can draw from for that. Um, we have our DM notes, so we're ready to uh, answer any questions that might uh, come up and I don't know I feel like this is more than adequate to run the game now for me I would probably go the extra extra bit and the monsters that I chose I would make like hero quests quote unquote looking um, frames for them so that they kind of look a little more I don't know spicy or whatever um, but yeah for the most part we're good to go we adjusted the monster's difficulty level. We put a bunch of monsters that were obstacles more than more than challenges. Uh, and I definitely think it has a good feeling of being a maze. We've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different traps. Um, so yeah, I would say that um, so this dungeon is pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and circle this chest real quick. So don't forget about it. And now, if I turn my GM overlay down, uh, you can see that all that stuff that we made, the players aren't going to see it. So we're just going to double check to make sure all that is hidden. Sweet. And then as needed, we're going to put stuff out into the world. And we also came up with a good uh, way to sort of handle where is the MacGuffin. So two different places. Uh, wherever they reach time-wise, um, that'll be where the MacGuffin is. What does the MacGuffin do? Um, it's a medallion next slot item that operates as a headband of intellect. But um, 
it also has a, a divination type ability. So um, it'll probably allow you to cast divination once per day, but it can actually get through uh, blockable stuff. I don't know. It's a plot item. Um, so yeah, there you go. We have built a dungeon. Uh, this will be an entire four-hour encounter, like, no problem. Uh, the best thing about Roll20 is once you've built something like this, you can always use Transmog to reuse it. So if you have a different group and you need a side quest dungeon or just a dungeon uh, that matches in some way this description, you could just bring it on over, maybe swap a few monsters out, maybe run it exactly as is, but you're good to go. So... Uh, hopefully that was helpful for some people, but that is how I do it. It's how I take uh, an empty roll twenty screen and turn it into a one, you know, a, a dungeon. So that's the whole process. All right, talk to you later.